uh, hi friends a very good evening and uh, uh, thank you for joining the fourth part of this uh, of of this series of live sessions where we are actually building a semantic search engine for question and answer repositories and uh, uh, can you folks please confirm in the chat window uh, if everything is working as expected i can hear myself on youtube so if you folks can confirm on the chat window if you are able to hear what i am saying and also uh, see my screen so that we know that there are no technical glitches so i'll wait for that confirmation here but from my side i can see my own feed uh, back right so yeah you can hear cool cool so we'll start the session itself in about a minute or a couple of minutes and today will be the final session right so it's a four part session so uh, this is part 4 right so we will continue where we left off again i have a little thunderstorm that's picking up right outside uh, where i live here so uh, let's 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 make sure in case there is a power failure uh, i might get disconnected for a few minutes before the generators kick in so just please be patient okay uh, sounds good so okay uh, let's wait for a minute or so again just like in the previous sessions from 7 pm to about 8 to 8 10 pm i'll cover all the concepts again today i'll try to finish there is slightly more code than yesterday to cover today because we're trying to put everything together but everything will be built on code snippets that we've already covered in the previous sessions and once we finish that i'll spend the rest of the time answering your q and a uh, over this chat right so let's just let's just uh, clear that okay sounds good so it's 7 pm so let's get started uh, i'll go through the concepts again this is where we left off in the previous session we learnt how to basically in so we went through this python code snippet yesterday wherein we took all the questions titles all the qis all the titles we inserted the title uh, using the so basically we indexed the title right into our elastic search we also computed the sentence vectors using our universal sentence encoder we also inserted the fight well dimensional sentence vectors or semantic semantic sentence vectors right so we indexed everything into elastic search and i also showed you how you can use curl itself to get some high level statistics about the index that we created or the database that we created if you want to think about it from a database perspective which is questions index today let's focus on the search part and then how do we deploy everything so first and foremost okay so can you search by ids right so if you recall yesterday one thing that we did as part of our code snippets let me show you that code snippet again i'm just using the atom uh, uh, code editor which is a open source code editor by github very simple tool so yesterday if you notice this is the code that we went through yesterday in this code if you notice when we were inserting these elements look at this when we were inserting each of the questions okay this was this this was the line which was actually inserting or injecting everything into the questions index if you notice in the body we placed both the title and the title vector but the document the id that we gave for each of our questions was nothing but the document id right so the document id which was there in the csv so if you want to search one of the simplest ways to search again not very useful in our context is to search by the document id so you can just type this on your in your web browser you can just say local host local host means your local computer 9200 is where elastic search is available the index that we want to use is the questions index and i'm saying there is underscore here right so i want to see document whose id is 80 right so that's what that's what this whole thing means so if you just click on this look at this it gives you the whole document look at this the document whose id is 80 of course there is there is some title here look at the title says sql statement execute multiple queries in one statement and the title vector look at this the title vector is a fight well dimensional vector that we inserted right so if you want to search by id you can just do it i mean this is the simplest way to do it now what i have done apart from that is i have created a very simple code snippet here this code snippet is called top200kquestions.py i'll explain you this code what it does is it takes the question it takes data from questions.csv 
if you recall this is something that we saw yesterday the questions.csv right it reads the questions.csv it creates a new file called top 200k questions data in this file it will just print the id of each question and also the title of each question so that because remember when we created the index yesterday the questions index we only indexed the first 200k questions while there are more than 1 million questions we chose to build a smaller sized index and see how everything works right so let me walk you through this code this code is very simple code let me just quickly walk you through it so this is top 200k questions again this code is very similar to the code that we have seen earlier you are just importing a bunch of libraries you are saying the maximum number the total number of questions you want to uh, write into the final document is 200k you are maintaining a count here the only change here is I'm opening a file here. Look at this. I'm saying this is your standard file open in Python, right? I'm opening a file called top 200k questions in write mode with encoding equals to Latin 1. Again, we explained about encoding equals to Latin 1 in the previous sessions when we learned about questions.csv. Now, this is we have seen code very similar to this. If you notice, this code is exactly similar to uh, uh, it's very similar to this code in index.py that we have seen already earlier. That's why I'll not spend too much time going line by line, but I'll give you an overview. We are first opening the questions.csv. We are reading, uh, we are creating a CSV reader. We are skipping the header. And then for each row, what are we doing here? We are taking the document ID and title, and we are simply writing it to this file that we opened. Look at this, we've opened this file, right? What are we writing to that file? We are writing the document ID, comma, title, backslash N. So in each line, we'll have the document ID and the title corresponding to each of your questions. And we are we are incrementing this count and printing as soon as we have 100 rows. For every 100 rows, we'll just print it. And then if the number of rows is 200,000, we break, right? And finally, we close the, the file that we created. It's simple code, nothing very fancy. It's just three lines code edit. The only edit from the previous code snippets that we have seen is creating this output file writing to this output file and closing this file that's all everything else we have already seen earlier now if you look at this if you look at this if you look at this code now uh, okay so present working directory cd data i've moved the output to data so if you just do vim um, top 200k questions data look at this so the very first id was 80 right so th this is what we used as document id right so for example what we saw just a while ago where we said we want to find the document or the question with id equals to 80 because of the way we have written the code this 80 gave us this whole thing right if you recall sql statement execute multiple queries in one statement look at this it's the same thing no so the id is 80 sql statement execute multiple queries in one statement again the purpose of doing this is to ensure that everything was inserted as we expect now of course there are a bunch of questions here there are close to 200000 questions here there are exactly 200,000, not close to. There are exactly 200,000 questions here. If you want to see what types of questions are there, you can just quickly use this for ease. Again, this is not yet such. Okay. This is just to verify that whatever we've inserted is sensible. Okay. This is like a simple test script that you can use to verify if things are working as expected. Now, for example, if you want to see this, let's take some ID here, right? Let's take this ID. Okay. Or let's take some random ID here. Okay, let's take some random ID like this. Now, in our query, if we give this ID here, if we give this document ID, look at what we get. We get MySQL training videos and some vector here, right? And of course, for this ID, the title is MySQL training videos. Makes a lot of sense, right? Very good. So things are working. Things have been indexed as we expect. Simple sanity check. Next, let's do a couple of things. First, the the model that we discussed about yesterday which is the universal sentence encoder 4 we will first download this whole model to disk okay and we will whenever we need to use this model we load it from disk instead of always downloading it from the internet right just to make things faster so what do you do it's very simple on my mac which is the host operating system in my case Right. Look at this. So you can just go to that URL that I've shown you yesterday. Right. So you can just go to. So let me show you this. Okay. What's happening here? Why did it get stuck? Okay. So 
So let me go here. So universal sentence encoder four, right? So you can just go to this link. There is this download button, which is 915 MB compressed file. So just click on this, it will download the whole thing into your local box. So first thing that I do here is after I download it to my local box or my Mac, I copy it again. We have seen the Docker copy command, right? So what I what am I doing here? I'm saying Docker copy the the zipped file or the tar file, right? The universal sentence sentence encoder 4.tar.zg. This whole file I'm saying move it. This is the source. This is the destination. In the destination, I'm saying my container name is my elastic. This is the path where I want you to store it. So I've downloaded it from the internet to my Mac and I'm just copying it to my Docker using Docker copy. We have seen this earlier. So I don't need to explain how Docker copy works internally. Then within the Docker itself, I'm going to because this is in tar format, right? So unzip will not work because unzip can only unzip anything that is zipped using the zip format. This is tar format. So on my Docker, I need to first install something that can untar the whole thing, right? Something that can unzip this thing or untar the whole thing, right? So again, we have seen yum earlier in the previous sessions. I'm just installing tar. So this will give us the command line tool through which we can unzip this. So in this line, what are we doing? We're saying tar and this whole command basically, this whole parameter is basically say unzip it. So this is the file that needs to be unzipped or untarred and the output, I want to write it to this folder. Okay, so if you go and check my Docker instance here. So if you just go and check the Docker instance here. Okay, so there is this folder called use for, right? So CD use for. Now look at this. These are all the contents of my whole model. It contains a saved model, which is fairly large. And then it has some additional files called assets and variables. Assets is a folder, variables is also a folder. But you don't have to worry about it. This is the model that Google's TensorFlow Hub gave us and we'll just use it as this, right? So, so let's go back to our code. So these, these couple of lines of code helps us download the universal sentence, sentence encoder for and use it locally instead of always downloading it from the internet. Now let's go and write the code. So I'll explain you a code snippet called search elastic search dot py search es dot py in this single in this single Python file, we will search both using keywords, which internally uses a TF IDF like mechanism. Also, we will search using semantic vectors and cosine similarity. Right. So I've discussed about cosine similarity in the previous sessions, right? Of course, you can use any similarity function of your choice. I'll also explain you how to use other similarity or distance functions in a little while. Okay. So let me explain you the code snippet for this line by line. I'll also show how it works when you execute it. So this is called search es dot py. Okay. So let's go through each of these functions first. There are three important functions and there's a main function here. I hope all of you know that whenever you run a Python script, it starts with this main function. Okay, so let me explain these functions, not too much code, it's very simple code. So the connect ES, look at this, connect to elastic search. We have seen this code, right? Already earlier in the previous sessions. What are we doing? We are simply connecting to elastic search on the local host, which is available on port 9200. If everything is working well, we print connected to ES and we are returning the elastic search variable that we have here. Simple. This function, we've seen all these commands, it simply returns us the elastic search uh, variable ES here that we need for further processing. Next comes this. Okay, so this is very interesting. So this does, this function does keyword search. Look at what it does. It takes the elastic search variable, which we will use. It also takes the query that we want to search with. Again, this is keyword search or the question that we want to search with. Right. This is keyword search. It's not semantic search, right? Keyword search, as I mentioned earlier, uses TF ID of based, uh, based algorithms. So how do you do it? It's very simple. You create a body here. You say what you want to do is query. You want to query the elastic search, right? And you want to match. You want to match all the titles which are similar to Q, right? Because look at it. What do we have in our elastic search instance? In Elasticsearch instance, for every question that we have, we have two things. We have the title and the title vector. We have the title and the title vector. Of course, we have the document ID itself. Right? There are three things. So I'm saying 
this query says match when you say simple match and give nothing else it will do keyword based match and it says in the whole repository that you have match all titles based on the standard tfidf based models that that key, that elastic search uses by default use it uh, search it with this query that's all this is your body rest everything is very simple now what are you going to do here you're going to say es dot search okay you're using this es instance because that's what is that's what established the connection to an elastic search you're saying i want to search and what index do you want to search questions index and what is the body what is your search all about your body equals to b that's it it will return something called res now now look at this res gives you a lot of data res gives you a lot of information about how fast it did tons of information we don't require all the information all we are looking for is to get to get the score see there are two things that are important for us what is the score i mentioned about scoring right Elasticsearch by default says this is the title this is the title of question one which matched most closely and this is the score so we only care about two things with this with this single line and with this very simple query Elasticsearch will search using keyword based search and for the top 10 results it will give you the score and what is the title that you want and you can print this very easily look at this code here so I'm just printing keyword search the res is what the elastic search returned right res is a json object so i'm saying in res go to hits and within that go to hits again right very simple so so for hit in this hit basically means all the results all the hits this is like a search hit right when you search elastic search right when you give a query and search all the hits that match it will return that's why the word hit comes into place here so this is just a simple loop here for hit in this Right? This is the standard syntax here. Now, what am I saying? For each hit, I'll get a score here. Look at this. What am I printing here? I'm printing hit score. So, this will give us for all the queries that matched, what is the score? And I'm adding a tab here and I'm saying whichever, uh, sorry. Uh, so, the hit source, the hit source basically means what is the document or the question I for which this hit, uh, the, uh, uh, what is the question I to which your query was hit successfully hit basically means you successfully got it right so you're going to go there and in this you had title right so I'm saying please print the title of this so this print command is very simple you're printing of all the search queries that elastic search re returned you're going to print the score and the title of the search results title of each of the each of the questions that we have or each of the documents that we have in elastic search that's it that's all there is right i'll show you how this whole thing executes in a couple of minutes okay so this is one function very important function for search this is for keyword search right so next is semantic search okay so sentence similarity using nearest neighbors we discussed about this in the previous sessions so this requires three things First, it requires the embedding model. It requires elastic search on which we will search and the sentence that we want to search for or the question that we want to search for, right? So look at, look at the steps. We have seen this step already, right? What does this step do? It is taking the sentence that we have or the query or the question that we have. It is, again, this, this whole syntax we have seen in the previous session, right? It is going to embed it into a 512 dimensional vector, convert it into a proto tensor convert into numpy nd array and then finally convert it into list so now query vector is the so imagine if somebody gives us a question q star right somebody gives us a question q star you pass it here right you also pass the model the model that you have the model m you pass it here the model that we have seen that we have already used earlier using tensorflow hub right these two things this es is basically the variable which has the connection to our elastic search instance Right. So what are we doing here? We are taking this sentence. We are converting. So this query vector is basically a list of 512 dimensional vector. Now look at how we construct our body. This is the important part. In our body, what are we saying? We want to query. Okay. We want to query first. What we want is a script score. Okay. Again, remember that you can write your own custom scoring functions using script score. Okay, so within this script score, if you notice this script store opens here, 
Look at this. So this indentation is slightly useful. It opens here, it closes here. Right? So within the script score, you say, what is your query? You're going to say match all, which means I don't, I don't have any specific keyword based query here. So the moment you say this, what it does is, again, you can find all this on Elasticsearch documentation. I'm no expert in Elasticsearch, but with simple Google search and reading the documentation, these are simple to figure out, right? So all that it says here is, my query that I want to do is match all, which means I, so query match all basically says, I don't have any keyword, I don't want to perform any keyword based search, right? I don't want to do it. Next it says, I want to use the script to score each of the results. And what is the script that I'm going to use? The source of the script is this function called cosine similarity, which is inbuilt in uh, Elasticsearch, which is inbuilt. And this cosine similarity takes two parameters, the query vector that we have and the title vector, which is there for each question. Remember in our Elasticsearch for each question QI, there is title and there is also title vector, right? So the way it will work here is it says, the, the query vector that I'll pass here, compute the cosine similarity between the query vector for the question Q star that I'm passing here and compare it with the vector that is there for every question's title vector. Again, remember that the dimensions have to be same because we're using the same model, the dimensions are the same. So what this function does exactly is, it takes, it, it, is, it is simply computing given our query vector, it is computing the cosine similarity of our query vector with every title vector that is there in the database, right? Or in, in our index, to be honest, okay? Now you might say, what is this plus one doing here? Remember cosine, cosine values lie between minus one and plus one, right? Cosine, cos, cos theta, right? Cos theta values lie between minus one and plus one. But the scoring functions that you have in Elasticsearch work only well when they're positive, when they're non-negative values. So you're adding this plus one so that the range, the cosine range, instead of it being from zero to one, now the range will be from zero to two. Because Elasticsearch, all the scoring functions that Elasticsearch has internally, they work for non-negative values. So to convert your cosine similarity whose range is minus one to one, you're just adding plus one here to make it non-negative. Very simple logic here. Then you are saying, okay, now the fundamental question here is what is query vector now? What is params dot query vector? You have to define that, right? So it says params query vector is equal to nothing but this query vector that we have. So what happens? This phi 12 dimensional vector will be pasted here. And this phi 12 dimensional vector will be passed as the first parameter to this question similarity function. And it will also compare it with the title vector for every question that you have. Remember that this cosine similarity is a function that is implemented in Elasticsearch. You can write your own function and make it work. The whole beauty of Elasticsearch is it's highly ex extendable. You can write your own scripting functions. It's slightly tricky to do it the first time, but it's very simple. I mean, there's a lot of documentation to help you with it. Right? So this is our body. Now, once you have the body, rest everything stays the same. Rest, the rest of the code is exactly the same as earlier. So what are you doing? You're saying, I want to perform elast. I want to use ES search. The index is questions index, the body B that we created, right? You get your results. Again, in results, results is a JSON object. In results, in hits, hits, you get each hit and you get this code. This code is exactly like what we have seen just five minutes back with keyword search. Right, you get the score and you get the title of each of the questions. That's all. Right, now your question could be, instead of cosine similarity, if I want to use Euclidean distance, or if I want to use some other distance metric, how to do it? I'll just show that code in a few minutes. Now, let's see, let's see what our main function does. It's very simple. This is again, extremely simple part. I'll execute this and show it to you. First and foremost, we are connecting to Elasticsearch by, use, by calling this function connect to Elasticsearch. Then we are loading the model. Look at this here, instead of giving a URL, we are giving the folder in which we have untarred or unzipped the universal sen sentence encoder model, right? So we have created this embed, which is nothing but your TensorFlow hub model. Then I'm creating this infinite loop here. What does the infinite loop do? It just asks for some input command line. 
like it just say we all know about input right in python whatever you input it will take it will copy that into query then i'm creating a start time and end time to see how much time this whole thing will take if if the query that i enter is capital e and d it will break or else what does it do it will print the query it will perform keyword search keyword search anyway will print the top 10 similar keyword similar queries or similar questions in our in our index i'm calling the sentence similarity by nearest neighbor that's it very simple code now if if we execute it let's see how it works okay so let me just execute it for you uh, okay uh, okay so we don't need this also okay so i just have some older versions of this but you can just run it like this so it takes a couple of seconds to load the model and all that right so just give it a couple of minutes first it connected to elastic search there are some warnings tensorflow warnings because we are not using uh, uh, we are not using nvidia graphics cards it takes it takes a couple of seconds to load the model but once it loads the model now let's see one if i enter a query right so how to in how to delete i mean how to delete a file in linux okay that's it look at it look at how much time it took this took about 842 milliseconds okay, slightly on the higher side but it will become it will become better okay look at this how to delete a file in linux these are the results that we got with keyword search these are the top 10 results that we got with keyword search these are the similarity scores elastic search automatically sorts it in descending order of similarity look at this this is my keyword search result this is the semantic search similarity okay keyword search uses a tfidf like score okay look at the range of numbers from 15 to 12 look at these numbers these numbers as we know lie between 0 to 2 right so the scale of these numbers is different from the scale of these numbers that's very important to remember okay secondly look at look at look at the first result it says how to forcefully delete a file how to delete a file such that delete is irreversible how to organize my file so it is giving decent results again remember our data set is only 200 k questions if you had more questions probably it will give us better similarity search now remember all this were keyword based search if you look at se semantic similarity based search they tend to be i mean look at it this first re removing a file in restricted folder in linux this option is not there anywhere here so the keyword search could not figure out that this is this is also a relevant relevant uh, or one of the top similar questions in our index it could never it couldn't figure it out but because we are using universal sentence encoding 4 it doesn't care about uh, the words it cares about the whole sentence itself now if i have to say something this is actually a very very relevant question compared to many of these questions right so keyword search is performing tfidf semantic similarity search is performing semantic similarity as i discussed in yesterday's session we can also combine both of them in many interesting ways if you want to have complete control you can take these scores you can also take these scores ensure that all the scores are normalized because this score numbers are much larger than the absolute value of these try to convert all these scores into a 0 to 1 range similarly normalize all of them into one, 0 to 1 range again all those who know basic data science i'm sure you can convert these into a simple range just do some simple scaling so that all these numbers lie between 0 to 1 all these numbers lie between 0 to 1 so that you can again one thing that i mentioned about combining these two explicitly by writing your own code is you can multiply the normalized score here and the normalized score here to get the final score right? one one simple way again there are some for example if you look at this how to forcefully delete a file this is there as a top keyword search result it's also there as a as a second most popular semantic search result right so th there are some overlaps between both of them but there are also some unique things like this which is primarily because of semantic similarity right so let's let's execute one more let's execute some more okay oh sorry so my my enter the query is here how to 
okay let me type something here how to install pip okay so okay see this took only 251 milliseconds so the first query takes a little time uh, to get to to set up the whole thing but otherwise it's very very quick it just took 251 milliseconds look at it look at the keyword search results it says unable to install pip permission denied error makes a lot of sense right so here also you have something like this easy install and pip doesn't work so there is some overlap between these two for example uh, how to pip install packages according to requirements.txt file in a local directory is there in query keyword search it's also there in semantic similarity search right so there is some overlap but remember we are only working with a very small database uh, so let's assume how to uh, how to read file in python okay i'm just i'm just typing it here okay look at this how to read specific number of floats from a file in python that's what keyword search results again this took only 256 milliseconds okay we have again some some amount of this time is taken to just print these values okay sometimes it, it, it takes time to even print because printing is a non trivially expensive thing computationally because it has to send some data to the monitor monitor has to print it all of that stuff we can reduce it further if you don't have the print statements right so look at this reading entire file in python this the semantic similarity works magically well this certainly makes a lot of sense to be the first search result so if you see for your problem that semantic search is giving more relevant relevant uh, more relevant results you can just give more importance when you're trying to combine these results you can do something like this you can say alpha times keyword score plus beta times uh, similarity scores right if you want to again the final score that you have the final score is alpha times keyword search score beta times similarity score first you have to normalize these values so that they all are in the same scale here the scales are different then you can say your alpha equals to one give more value to beta let's assume your beta is let's say three right some constants you can pick up so what does this mean you are giving more importance to semantic similarity and less importance to keyword similarity some very simple schemes you can do like this this is a simple additive scheme right you can come up with any scheme like that or you can also do this so keyword search uh, power alpha multiplied by uh, semantic similarity power beta you can do something like this also of course for any of these first you should normalize these weights to be in the same scale right then you can say your beta equals to 3 your alpha equals to 1 so as to give more importance to this oh then there is a problem because you're you're raising oh there is a small problem there if you do this your numbers imagine all these are all these are numbers between 0 to 1 but still it will work don't worry about it you can make it work so you can come up with some scheme like this again you might have to experiment with multiple schemes and see which of them works better it's just very problem specific tinkering that you have to do right but one very important thing here is even though we have 200k questions both our keyword search and semantic search are being performed both of them are being performed in approximately 250 milliseconds which is pretty decent right again on this computer imagine if i'm not streaming video again there's a lot of compute that is, that is take that is being taken up because i'm streaming this i'm recording this imagine if i had a fully dedicated system without any print statements we can bring this down by writing slightly more efficient code okay so here i'll just type end and we're done right so very simple code here right so now let's go here okay so you the, you can use some logic to combine scores some of which that i have explained now some of it that i have explained in the previous session some very simple schemes here now instead of using cosine similarity if you want to use other distances in mathematics an l2 distance is nothing but the euclidean distance right so l2 distance we've seen what a euclidean distance is right in the previous sessions that's what is called also called as l2 distance now there is also something called as l1 distance or also called as the manhattan distance right so i'll just explain you the intuition behind l1 and l2 distances and i'll show you some simple code snippets from elastic search documentation to use them imagine if i have two points p1 and p2 what is the l2 distance it is the length of the shortest line between p1 and p2 
That's what it is, right? So this length is L2. The, the, the length of this line is your L2 distance between P1 and P2. The L1 distance is, imagine if you can only walk parallel to your y-axis or x-axis. You can't walk whichever direction you want. You can only walk parallel to your y-axis or parallel to x-axis. Then what do you do? You first start walking parallel to your y-axis, some distance, and then you walk parallel to your x-axis to some distance to reach P2. So the minimum distance that you have to walk, which is this distance plus this distance. Okay, the minimum distance that you have to walk, wherein you are constrained to walk parallelly to y-axis and x-axis to go from P1 to P2, the, the total distance that you have to walk is called as L1 distance. This is one of the distance measures that is also used in AI and machine learning. There are some advantages of L1, some advantages of L2. We'll not be able to go into the depths of it in this discussion. But if you want to use these L1 distance or L2 distance, again, remember their distances. Remember very importantly, their distances, they're not similarities. Remember that distances, if you want to create a similarity using distances, you should design a function such that if distances increases, similarity should decrease and vice versa. If distances decrease, similarity should increase. So there is some very simple sample code. Again, Elasticsearch documentation is very, very good. Uh, okay, where is this? Okay, so hash, okay. So if you just go here, there is vector functions here somewhere. Vector functions, okay. Yeah, it's here. Uh, okay, functions for vector fields, right? So look at this. So let's create an index. So this is very similar to what we have seen, right? So you're creating a dense vector of dimensions three, all that stuff. This is just a sample code that they've shown. If you want to use cosine similarity, right? I actually read this documentation and used it. Look at this, it says use cosine similarity. This is the params, this is my dense vector. And for each of these, they explain why they have it. I told you, right, the script adds plus one to cosine similarity to provide this code from being negative, right? So if you want to use cosine similarity, you can just use cosine similarity here and add one so that the values are not uh, negative. Similarly, if you want to use dot product between these vectors, just a dot product, you can use dot product. And after you do dot product, you need to come up with some mechanism such that, again, look at this. They've written the whole function here. You can write a function of your own carefully uh, using, using, using the syntax that Elasticsearch accepts. Similarly, look at this. Here, they're using L1 norm. L1 distance or L1 norm is the same thing, right? You can take L1 norm or L1 distance uh, of, of whatever you want. And look at, look at, look at the function that they've written here. They're saying, their similarity is measured as, look at this function here. The function that they're using here is similarity equals to one by one plus L1 distance. This is the similarity function they're using. Why are they using this? Now look at this. If L1 distance increases, similarity will decrease. And even if L1 distance is zero, you will not get division by zero. That's why this one plus is added in the denominator, right? This is very simple. See. This basically says, I want my, at the end of the day, your similarity should decrease when distances increase and vice versa, right? So instead of L1, you can also write L2. This function is written in such a way primarily because this is guaranteed to be positive because distances are always positive. And even if this is zero, this one plus helps you ensure that you don't have division by zero errors. Very simple, very simple scoring function that they've written here, right? Similarly, you can do L2 also. Look at this, you have L2 norm. Right? So you can use, you can write your own functions if you want. Okay. So this is one way where you can use L1 and L2 distances in addition to cosine similarity. Right? Again, I provided the link here. You can, you're, I mean, this is very easy to read and experiment. I'll share all the source code that we're discussing today. You can just go and modify it and try with other distance measures also. Okay. Next comes the very important question. This is a question that one of our students also asked in the live session, I think yesterday. What is the nearest neighbor implementation that is there in Elasticsearch? Okay, so uh, this was not clear from their documentation. So I went and searched on their GitHub profile, right? So this is the Elasticsearch GitHub. And after reading some open issues that they have, this is an issue which has been there from mid 2019. So early, so if you look at this post from December, I think uh, she is one of the teammates at, um, at Elasticsearch, if I'm not wrong, because she's very active on this group. 
Look at this. As of December 3rd, 2019, she says, currently we don't have a solution for approximate nearest neighbor search. Only brute force, precise K nearest neighbor search is used right now. And we are investigating algorithms and prototypes for approximate nearest neighbor search. So this is as of 3rd December. So as of 3rd December 2019, which is about five, six months back, they have been still using brute force nearest neighbor, but they are prototyping and experimenting with better algorithms. Some of the algorithms that we discussed earlier, like locality sensitive hashing, like neighborhood graph based approaches, right? We have mentioned some of this in the previous live sessions, right? So they're prototyping some of this, but it is still not clear because what the version that we are using is 7.7.0. It was not clear from the documentation what they're exactly using today. But another thing that I realized while reading this GitHub thing is, sorry, sorry. So one thing that I realized is at the end of it, this is just about one month back, they have, we have decided to contribute the Lucene's implementation of approximate nearest neighbor search. Because anyway, Elasticsearch itself is built on Lucene, right? So they're saying we are contributing and using the approximate nearest neighbor search that is there on Lucene. But if you go to these, uh, if you go to these issues and read about Lucene's documentation and Lucene's issue, they are saying that the status is still open. This issue is not resolved. It's a the priority of this is a major feature that they're still experimenting with. There is some there is some discussion on what is the best way to implement and things like that, right? So I think. Elasticsearch as of now still uses some brute force version. Again, it is not very clear uh, from, the, from the GitHub uh, issues that are being tracked, but still it's doing pretty good job actually. Now, one thing that I, that I read is the Amazon Web Services, Elasticsearch service, right? I was talking to you about this, right? So let's go to this post. This is a post by Amazon's, remember, cloud-based services also provide Elasticsearch as a service. We discussed this in yesterday's session, right? So AWS, which is Amazon's web services, has an Amazon Elasticsearch service. So on 3rd of March, which is just literally like a couple of months back, they have built a K nearest neighbor search, custom built it. So they use this library called NMS lib. And they said, we don't worry about what Elasticsearch implements internally. But many of our customers want to use a K nearest neighbor search, which is approximate nearest neighbor. And they've used this library, integrated this library into their elastic search that they provide as a service. And now if you're using K, if you're using elastic search on AWS, you can actually get K nearest neighbor similarity using this library called NMS lib. So if you go and check this library, it's a very well written library. So they've taken this open source library, very efficiently written. Again, it's an efficient similarity search library and toolkit for evaluation of K nearest neighbor for generic non-metric spaces, right? It's, it's actually very nice open source project. Uh, and I read through some of the documentation, they're using approximate nearest neighbors. And this, this toolbox, this open source project implements graph based, it implements graph uh, neighborhood graph based methods. Right, so you can read that it's it's all available. So the good thing is, if you are using Amazon's web services now, again this is something that we use, and we use the K nearest neighbor that is there, this uh, the K nearest neighbor based similarity search, which is inbuilt. Thankfully, we don't have to write code for this. Amazon has taken care about all the hard work of integrating NMS lib into Elasticsearch. Right, so. They're doing a pretty good job. They're moving slightly faster than the official Elasticsearch open source releases. Now, some students ask us, what is a good open source project to, to do? I want to write an open source project, right? So NMS lib is one such very nice example. Here, what, 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 what did this person do? Again, this is, a, this is a personal project started by, again, I'm very bad at pronouncing these names, North European or Scandinavian names. I think he's Norwegian. Uh, Bilig Shekhan Naidan. Okay, I don't know how to pronounce it properly. I think I got it at least half right. So NMS lib is a very nice package that he wrote in C++ to fundamentally implement K nearest neighbors, right? Or a nearest neighbor search. They're doing a simple nearest neighbor search using the best computationally, the, one of the most efficient systems. 
So if anybody wants to contribute to a nice open source project, take up something like Elasticsearch. Find something that it is lacking, right? Implement something like this. It's a phenomenal project. And this guy actually compares his implementation with a lot of other open source implementations. And this can scale to almost 1 billion uh, a, a data store with even 1 billion sentences or documents. It works really, really. It scales very, very well. It's because it scales so well, a large company like AWS said, okay, let's use this best source and put it out there. Imagine the amount of contribution and amount of brand value and amount of skill that Naidan has and he showcased through his GitHub profile. So if you want to build a good open source project in your AI or machine learning, this is a very, very good example, right? So it's a, it's a good example to be inspired by. Okay. Now the next thing is how do we deploy all this? Now we have something working. How do we deploy all of this? Okay. So let me walk you through a couple of things. So we will deploy it using an API and we'll build the we'll build the APIs using Flask. There are many other ways you can do it. Python has tons of ways you can build web APIs. We will be using Flask primarily because we've already done an earlier live session on how to use APIs, how to build APIs using Flask and how to deploy them on Amazon's AWS EC2. Right? EC2 basically means they give you a computer on the cloud and you can do whatever you want with it. Right, so that, that's what it is. So I'll, I'll show you some code for this in just a couple of minutes. I'm assuming you know some of it, but even if you don't know, I'll give you some primer so that you can understand this code easily. Next, how do you deploy everything to a server? Remember, we have a, this is this is our box. This is our Mac OS, right? This is my Mac OS, our host operating system. I have a Docker engine running on this. I have a Docker running here. Now, how do I take this and deploy it to a server? There are many ways of doing it. Two of the simplest ways here is you write a shell script with all the commands that you executed to set up this Docker file with all the uh, with all the with all the libraries with all the modules that you installed. That's one way. For example, let me show you. This is this is what I have done. Okay, again, this is the simplest way. So if you do vim inst, sorry, let me go here. Okay, so here is an install script that I've written. So all these yum installs, pip installs that I've talked to earlier about, I've just put everything into a shell script. What is a shell script? Shell script is a very simple thing. You write all the commands that you want to execute on the terminal in a file. Okay, shell script is basically a very simple script that you write in Linux or Unix systems. All the commands that we executed on the terminal, just put it in a file and just execute it. That's all. So after you do it, just say front slash install.sh. It knows that it has to run this and it will simply run this whole thing. It will install all these packages. So for deployment, one of the simplest ways of deploying, again, not always the best way, is just create the shell scripts which will install everything into your Docker image. That's one way. The second way that a lot of people use is they create something called as a Docker file. Again, we'll not be able to go too deep into it, but I'm pointing you some to some documentation. Uh, let me show you. Again, this creating a Docker file is also very simple. So if you go here, look at, look at what it says. A Docker file says, I want to use this Docker image. I want to use the Docker image for Ubuntu 18.04 version. And I want to copy some data. I want to run these scripts and I want to run this command. So a Docker file is basically a list of things that you want to do when you create a Docker instance or when you create a, when you create a container on your Docker engine. It's basically a list of commands that you give and these commands are very simple. Look at this. They're very readable. So I'm providing you a link here because I didn't use the Docker file approach. Well, that's one way of doing it. This is something that a lot of people do use. Other way is just do it using shell scripts, right? Next. So look at this. First, we'll build the API so that we can we can call this call a whole of our search engine uh, for Q&A using web APIs. You deploy your whole Docker to your to some server of your choice if this server is a computer that you own just deploy it or else you can also take a server on a cloud server like on aws there is this thing called ec2 similarly there is there are cloud servers on azure you can get a server on google compute platform any any anything of your choice these are the three most popular cloud services just get a server just get a box right and again we have done an earlier live session explaining how to 
get one EC2 instance or how to get one server on EC2. Okay, we have not yet done for Azure and GCP, but you can just check out that live session if you're interested. But otherwise, I mean, you can just Google search for how to create an EC2 instance or how to create a server on EC2. You'll get tons of videos. It's extremely simple. So, so if you have your own server in your office, you can just deploy everything using Docker files and shell scripts on this server. If you want to deploy it on AWS, just create a server or an instance on EC2 and just again, then you follow either your shell script approach or Docker file approach. There are other approaches also. I'm, I'm trying to cover the simplest approaches here, right? So this is how you deploy everything. Now, one thing that is not yet clear is how do you build the API, Flask API around this? So let me walk you through some simple code for that. Okay, so a couple of things. For those of you who have not seen the earlier session or who do not know Flask APS, here is a very nice, simple tutorial to create a minimal Flask API. I'll walk you through the example that we have, but in case you don't know, this is a very simple, literally like, it's a very simple code that they show on how to build it. Okay, if you want to build a simple Flask application, it's a small, neat blog. You can read it very easily. And it's very helpful if you don't know how Flask works. Okay. Now we have this whole thing called search, elastic search, flask api.py. I'll explain this. But before we do this, we have to install Flask, right? So on the Docker image, I said pip 3.6 install Flask. So what this line does is it installs Flask for us, right? Then once you install Flask, the next thing that we have to do here is you have to set the language. So I'm saying LC all is English US and just export it. So these two lines basically, so export this basically means that it is setting an environment variable called LC all. Again, this is important for Flask because we have to explain what language are we going to use uh, for all of our systems here, right? So without these two, my Flask wasn't running. So I just Google searched for why, why I'm getting the error. I mean, just a Google search away. Again, I didn't know this earlier. I got stuck when I was trying to execute my Flask APIs. I got an error. I Google searched and figured this out. Next, remember all of our code is in search es flask api.py. So if you want to start this API, you just have to say export flask app. Again, this is creating an, this is saying the environment variable flask app is this Python file. So export is basically a simple command in Python, sorry, in, in Unix or Linux based operating systems, which says make the environment variable flask app equals to this. Then we say Python 3.6 hyphen M flask run. So when you run this, what happens is because the flask app, the variable name flask app is set to elastic es hyphen flask api.py. When you run this, it will start running this code. It will start running this code. Now the whole concept behind APIs is this. Look at this. This is my box. Okay. This is my computer. Let's say this is my desktop. There is a software port. I talked to you about software ports, right? Or network ports. They're also called as network ports. Suppose I'm on some other, let's assume I'm on my, I'm on my phone. Suppose I want to call some function here. So what Flask API does is it creates this whole Flask app, which is running here in the, in, in the computer, but I can access this using this port. The default port is port 5000. Remember Elasticsearch was accessible through port 9200. Similarly, the Flask app that we are running is accessible through port 5000. Similarly, we had 9200 behind which Elasticsearch is running. So imagine if I'm on my phone, I can, if I want to call this function, if I want to call one of the most, if I want to imagine if this is my phone, I type a question and I send it. Okay. I type a question. I send it. Now, by saying that it has to go to port 5000, if I, because, because remember my Flask this app, my Flask app is running on port 5000, right? If I just say go to port 5000 on this computer, again, this computer could have a different, I, I just have to give the IP address of this computer. This computer could be somewhere on the other end of the internet, doesn't matter, right? Or it could be on the same computer, doesn't matter, right? You just have to give the IP address of this computer so that we can reach this computer. On this IP address, you say on port 5000, send this question that I have. Then what this app returns back is it returns all the similar questions and you can actually see them here. Okay. That, 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 that's how everything will work, right? So this is, this is like the simplest way to understand web APIs. And 
web, they're called web APIs because they all use web based protocols, right? Your HTTP, HTTPS on all of these, which are web internet or web based protocols, right? So now let's see, let's see the code behind this. The code behind this is also very simple. Again, we have already seen the search es.py, right? So the search es flask API is very similar. There are a couple of changes. Look at this. We are importing flask here. If you notice this, this is exactly the same. The connect to es is exactly the same that we have seen. The connect to es here is exactly the same thing that we have seen in search es. So it's exactly the same code, no changes. We are just trying to wrap what we have in an API. Now the keyword search, what it does here is this. I've removed all the prints. I don't care about the prints. Okay, so let's, let's just remove all the prints. What are we doing here? The code here, the core code is the same. We are creating the body to create a keyword based search based on the query. And this result is what we are completely returning it back. We are not printing anything here. Look at this, the code that we had, we've just completely removed that printing code. Next, for sentence similarity, it's exactly the same code. We, we have just removed, we have just commented out the whole print. I can delete it also, it will work perfectly all right. Right? Rest of everything is same. We take the sentence that is given to us or the query question that is given. We convert it into, I mean, using the, using the model, we get a query vector. Then we do cosine similarity. We get the results and we return the results. Now here is, here is a small code here. This is a Flask specific code. Now what are we saying here? We are saying create a Flask app here. Look at this. It says create a Flask app now. I'm connecting to my Elasticsearch instance. I'm loading my T TensorFlow hub model here. Now, this is a very important line in Flask APIs. What this line tells you is, remember this is my computer, right? This is my computer. We said this app will be running, this whole, uh, this whole search app will be running using Flask API on port 5000. So it says, you come to my computer on port 5000, I am running. Just give this path, which is search, followed by whatever query you want to give. Right. So if, if you want to see this in execution, let me just show you that. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll show you how this whole thing works in execution in a couple of minutes. First, let's go through this code. It's very simple code. So what this line says here is, so it, this line says, okay, suppose if you have local host, go to local host, okay, port 5000. And in the path, in the path that you give, just give search as the path. After you give that, whatever you give here will be treated as the query. Now, you can't use spaces here. You can't use spaces here. So one thing that a lot of companies do here is, imagine if, my, imagine if my query is how to install pip. Let's assume that's my query. Okay, how to install pip. If you just give this string with spaces, it will not work here. Because space is completely not useful here. So one thing that we do here is, we give how plus two plus install plus pip. So whatever question we have between each consecutive word, we will just add a plus and we will paste this whole thing in the URL only. Look at this local host. This says the computer that you want to go to, right? Or you can give the IP address of your computer, right? So 127.0.0.1 in computer networks means the computer that you're currently on. This is the port number. This is the path. So this path basically corresponds to this function. Remember this path. So we have already come to this whole uh, whole app, the Flask app that you have running, the Flask API app that you're running, right? So this search basically tells you which function to execute. You might want to execute different functions for different paths here. So here we are saying, whenever front slash search is used, please execute this function now. And whatever is there in the query will come in as a parameter to this function. Now, what are we doing in this function here? Very simple. We are taking all the pluses and representing it with space. Because we know the query, remember, the query itself that we get, every word is separated using a plus symbol, right? Again, you can use any symbol of your choice, technically, right? We are just using plus. So again, plus is a very common thing that a lot of companies also use. Now with plus, we are just replacing plus with space. Now your question could be, what if the query itself has the plus symbol? then you'll have to modify it slightly, pre-process it and things like that. But you can make the whole thing work. Now, I got my query. What are we doing here? We are doing keyword search, right? We have the Elasticsearch instance already. 
this queue we are doing keyword search the results we are storing it in results keyword search we are performing semantic search right look, look at we are performing semantic search with this query and we are getting the results here the final return see at the end of the day this function has to return something which is returned back to the user look at this so here imagine if i have another mobile phone or computer that is calling this i'm passing look at this i i say i want to go to this computer this port number this path and this is my search query right it sends this it has to get something back right that something back is nothing but whatever is returned by this function so i'm saying whatever we have to return is empty initially it's just empty string then what are we doing here you can return whatever you want in whichever fashion you want okay some people return json objects you can return whatever you want so this code is exactly like what we have seen earlier right for each hit right for each hit we are just adding it or concatenating it to the string called return return plus equals to i'm saying this is this is a search result from keyword the score and the title similarly this loop also what does it do to your return to this variable called ret it is just concatenating the saying that this is a result from semantic search whatever is the score that semantic search re resulted in and whatever is the title it resulted in and we are returning it now if you execute this whole thing uh, okay let me start executing this just give me a second okay so let's let's start executing our uh, python 3.6 ah okay one second uh, flask okay so i already set all my environment variables as i've shown you here right I've, I've installed flask i've set my environment variables i just have to start running my flask okay so if i run my flask here my flask is running okay see my flask started running again we are just doing it in a test mode it's not a production and this this is uh and it says okay we are running it in production all that stuff as soon as it started first couple of seconds it will take to connect to elastic search and load the model once it does all of this these are some warnings and uh, some warnings from tensorflow because we are not using nvidia nvidia graphics card okay it, it recommends that we use nvidia graphics card so what happened till now it literally executed this code now that's all this is the only code outside all functions right so it executed this code and the model is ready now now it says it is running on 127.0.0.1 which means on this local computer it's running it's available on 5000 using http protocol right now if i want to access this one way i can access it there are many ways i can access i can do it using browser using other programming languages etc another way i can do is using curl look at this look at this command now okay i'll copy this command i'll explain you so i have one more on the same box i have it look at what i'm running here i'm saying remember we told you that curl is a very simple tool through which you can get whatever you want on the web this time basically says how much time did it take to execute this whole command because we want to see how much time the api is taking right and i'm saying use the http protocol go to the go to the same system as we are 5000 search within search i'm saying how to install python look at this so now what happens here is the moment i execute this look at this the moment i execute this okay it took about 668 uh, milliseconds right the first one takes a little time look at what it returned it said this result is based on keyword search this is the score this is the result that i got simple right so if, if you run it again uh, so let's say how to install pip okay i'm just changing the query slightly it became slightly faster again you can optimize this code slightly i've tried not to optimize it as much right but you can optimize it okay for example let's say how to install java I, i'm just i'm just giving it some queries here again this took only 250 milliseconds uh, what i've observed is in the first couple of times that you're calling this api it takes slightly more time uh, probably because it is loading some data into ram uh, another important thing that you can do here is look at how much memory it is consuming right so docker stats this whole thing is consuming about 2.778 gb this docker instance this docker instance my elastic is running our model it has elastic search it has all of that running right now it takes roughly about just under 3 gb of ram right cpu also it's not using much but let's let's just execute this and see how much cpu it uses oh it'll just go up uh, see cpu went to 30 percent right if you just saw that 
So, okay. CPU went to 30 percent, uh, 25, 30 percent, right? Because when you're executing this, it will consume some CPU resources, right? So, I think the first couple of times you call this API, what happens is it is trying to load some of the Elasticsearch inverted indices to RAM, but after that it becomes very fast. I've observed 250 milliseconds as the typical average time it takes to run. Uh, let's assume you do how to install, let's say Ruby. I don't know if it's available. See, it takes roughly 260 seconds, 260 milliseconds, right? So it's fairly quick. It's reasonable. We wanted under half a half a second. Under 500 milliseconds, we're getting like quarter, quarter of a second. It's reasonable, not bad. For a first cut solution, not bad. Now, what I have in mind, I know it's already 8 p.m. Let's just finish this with some extensions and projects that I'll suggest those of you who are interested can pick up. First thing that I'll suggest to you, these are simple extensions or optional assignments that you can take up. I'll share all the code uh, by the end of this session. I'll put it in the description section of this video. Think of some simple ways of combining keyword search and semantic search. Some of the methods that I discussed in this session and the previous sessions and try to come up with a final ranking using the final score. Very simple. This should not take you more than half an hour, one hour to build. Number one. Number two. Yesterday we said uh, we can have an architecture where we have containers in such a way. Again, in previous session when we discussed about container architectures, uh, let me show you this. Okay. So in this alternative design, I mentioned that you will have, you can have one Docker, which is the whole app itself. You can have another Docker container, which is running Elasticsearch another docker which is containing the sentence vectorization. So try to implement this type of design. Of course, it will require you to do some Google search, but uh, it's not rocket science to figure it out. Again, if you are a DevOps engineer or a software engineer, this is a good exercise to pick up, right? So implement, implement it in such a way that you have one container for, for your sentence encoder use for, one container for Elasticsearch, one container for the Flask app and try to build a slightly distributed version. Right. Next, uh, another interesting project or small extension to this is try to estimate how many queries this system, the simple flask app that we have built, just call this, just write some code so that you're giving it, let's say 10 queries per second. Just find out how many, how much QPS can this tolerate? Can it, can it give? Okay. It's just a simple loop. You can write a Python code, right? Or you can even write a shell script or any code in any language because you can call the flask app using using APIs, right? Any programming language of your choice. Okay, we also have an another live session which is publicly available where we discuss about uh, how to call APIs in Python. Right? It's very simple. It's publicly available. Uh, so you can check that out, right? So the way I'm suggesting you to measure QPS because this Flask app right now, if you just give one query at a time, it's taking approximately 250 milliseconds to respond back. But what happens if you give 10 queries per second? Or if you give 100 queries per second, just call this 100 times a second. Just write a for loop and try to execute the for loop calling it 100 times. You might have to write some slightly multi-threaded code for that. right? Just try to create a system which calls this flask app 100 times and see till what level the under, to under, under 500 milliseconds is working out. Okay, This is simple, simple like stress testing the system. Those of you who have three plus years of engineering experience. Let's assume this system gives us, let's say 100 QPS. Again, I have not tested it. So I request you guys to test this. So let's assume my Flask app is able to respond back. My Flask app that we just built is able to respond back up to 100 queries per second with about, uh, with less than 500 millisecond latency. But the moment I have 1000 queries per second, the latency shoots up because it's not able to respond back. In such a case, I would recommend that you build a, you just use an open source load balancer or a load balancer that's available on AWS or Azure or anything. But then you have to build a slightly complex architecture where you have multiple Docker instances. Let's assume you have 10 Docker instances. In all 10 of them, you have a distributed ES running, right? So you have a distributed elastic search running. On these 10 Dockers, on some of them, you can run your, again, just do some simple analysis and see what is taking more time. Is it the vectorization that is taking more time or is it elastic search that's taking more time? You can just add simple code to this, right? To figure that out. Just add, okay, just see how much time this is taking to run, right? And that's very simple, right? We have 
we have so, shown some code to do that already so you just add uh, start time dot time end time dot time just do some simple understanding to see whether keyword search is taking more time or semantic similarity is taking more time my strongest gut feel is uh, semantic similarity will take more time and now if semantic similarity is taking more time if you want to have 1000 QPS can you add a load balancer and make the whole thing work okay again the first three are fairly easy the fourth one that's why I said people who have at least three years of engineering experience can try to build something like this or data science or machine learning experience can try it again none of them are machine learning specific projects but if you want a machine learning specific project one thing that I can suggest you is implement I mean just see how you can use elastic search remember elastic search has you can write your own custom scoring function right you can write your own custom scoring function right so see how you can actually take this library that I just mentioned NMS lib I'm sure there, there, there are people who have already done it, but just for your learning, uh, try to see if you can take this, uh, where is this? Okay. So try to see if you can take NMS lib and integrate it with Elasticsearch so that Elasticsearch itself can be speeded up. Because Elasticsearch, again, to the best of my knowledge, as of late 2019, they're still using brute force nearest neighbor. They're, they're still prototyping approximate nearest neighbors. I don't think it is still in production yet. I could be wrong here. Please cross check that. But if it is taking too much time, you can just use, again, we use AWS Elasticsearch ourselves when we are designing this because we don't have the operational headache as a small team. We don't have bandwidth and time, bandwidth and time to manage the hardware resources. So we just use AWS Elasticsearch and we've already started using uh, the K nearest neighbor search, which is based on NMS lib, right? So these are some projects that you can take up. Sounds good. So let's go to your questions now. Mm. so oh so when when you say docker is consuming two and a half gb of ram is the ram on the host computer yes remember the doc so this is this is my host my host has 16 gb of ram and i have a docker engine running on this and when i created this container i said i am willing to give up to 6 gb of ram so the host will give 6 gb of ram to this container of this two and a half gb is what is being used okay uh, okay, so let me see. Where do we use model parameter within the sentence similarity function? Which model parameter are you talking about? Uh, again, it doesn't matter. You the mo what model you use doesn't matter. All it matters is okay. Let me show that code snippet. Uh, look at this. When we are writing this code, right? Look at this. Uh, okay, so when we are going through this code. Again, Elasticsearch doesn't care which model you used to compute the vector. I think I mentioned this yesterday also. All that it matters, all that it cares about is you are giving it a vector. That's all it cares about. And it will use, see for that it doesn't matter which model you used. So you can change the universal sentence encoder to BERT. You can use any model of your choice. You can use word to vec you can use whatever you want. It will still work well. Because the way Elasticsearch is designed is it doesn't care about the the uh, doesn't care about what model is used to generate these dense sentence vectors. It doesn't care. Okay. Uh, so why are we considering only the first row in query vector? I think I mentioned this in yesterday, right? So look at this. So what it returns. Okay. So this embed the sentence returns a tensor flow tensor. Okay, a tensor is basically a generalization of matrix. Okay, so this is your array, this is your matrix, this is your tensors. Okay, this is a 3D tensor, there are 4D tensors, etc. It returns your tensor, you're converting into a proto tensor, then you're converting into an ND array. Remember, it's an N dimensional array, which means it could be a 3D array, 4D array, whatever array it is. When you're con converting it to two list, it will again give you a list of lists. But remember, our sentence itself, because we have only one sentence here, remember, we have only one sentence here, right? So the way the way you'll get it is you'll get you'll get the numbers, you'll get a matrix like this. Right? In this, the zeroth element basically means because what we care about is just the vector. 
what we are getting here is an ND array. We don't care about anything else. So you can print this ND array and you'll see that it looks like this. And the reason we have zero here is because there is only one element and we only care about that element, which is a 512 dimensional vector, right? Again, all that you can figure out by just seeing what is the dimensionality of this, print the data type. Those are simple skills that you should always use to understand what's happening in your code. So does the model work if you have only 100 questions? Remember, if you have only 100 questions, it will try to do the best it can do with 100 questions. The more the data, the, the better it is. Or can we implement semantic search with a data of 8,000 points? Yes, very easily. Remember, on my computer, I'm running with 200K questions. Right? I'm running with 200K questions. Of course, the questions are just titles of the questions, but it's doing a pretty good job. It's just consuming roughly under 3 GB of RAM. So on my, I mean, I think if I if I scale this slightly, I can even run it with 1 million questions, right? So it can, with 8,000 data points or 8,000 uh, vectors and 8,000 questions, it should be straightforward to do it. What if we have only 100 questions? It will still work. Uh, as I just mentioned, it will try to do its best. Whatever it can find, it will return you. Does keyword-based Elasticsearch give results with respect to sentence of the query and the result? One second, does keyword-based Elasticsearch gives results with respect to sequence of the query. No, it doesn't use the sequence information because it uses a TF-IDF like method, which I explained earlier. It breaks the whole question into individual words and it processes these words now. So it doesn't take the order or the sequence information much into consideration. That's why it's less powerful than semantic vectors because semantic vectors take into consideration the exact sequence of words also. Okay, uh, thank you, Suyash. I mean, I'm happy that you guys are enjoying it. We try to make them as comprehensive as possible. Again, this is literally four days of live sessions back to back, but we wanted to explain it line by line so that even students who are in the early sections of the course or students who just know basic Python can still follow. What kind of search technique Cora uses? Again, I mentioned this yesterday. Most of the companies, most internet companies use something like Elasticsearch with semantic similarity. So earlier, they used to build semantic similarity systems on their own. Right now, thankfully, Elasticsearch has some form of semantic similarity that you can build using sentence vectors. Most companies, again, uh, not Google-like companies. I know some of the largest e-commerce companies in the world and in India. I know some uh, large OTT providers like your, uh, like your media players who use it. And I'm sure companies like Cora also will be using something similar to this, if not Elasticsearch itself. The basics are the same. The concepts of inverted indices, nearest neighbor based sentence similarity, the concepts stay the same. Many of them actually use Elasticsearch. Some of them may not use it. They might use their own custom tool. Will there be any chance to get the same scores for two different documents? It's possible. It is probable, but very less likely. It is possible. It is possible. Okay, folks, uh, I think, uh, okay, uh, yeah, you can use Django. Again, that's what I mentioned, right? To build an API, I'm showing you Flask because it's the simplest one, but you can use Django also, right? So I understand we can evaluate search systems using NDCG, but is there any other way for Q&A perspective? Even for most Q&A systems, NDCG is what is used. Again, I know that NDCG is used for Google, for internet search. Uh, I've, I've seen this being used for internet search. It's used for product search, right? It's used for content search, okay? It's used for Q&A search. NDCG is what is used extensively. How to use a question based on text in document? Again, we have done a session earlier, which is called BERT. So we use BERT based models to build a question answer system. That is different from this task. In the question answer system, what you give here is you give a document of text, right? So you give some text. Let's assume you give some Wikipedia article, you give a question, right? And you, you feed both of them to a BERT like transformer model. And what it returns to you is the answer, the best answer it can give based on the text in this question. So this requires you to use a model like BERT and then fine tune it. We have done a session on this already earlier, right? A uh, BERT versus USE4, which would be better? Again, it's an experiment that you have to try with. USE4 
or uh, universal sen sentence encoder is specifically designed to encode sentences. BERT is a much more general purpose thing. BERT can give you word vectors, BERT can give you sentence vectors, it can give you a lot of stuff. USE4 is specifically, again, remember that USE4 and BERT, both of them are transformer based models. So you will have to experiment with multiple models like these and figure out what works best in your context. Okay. Okay, folks, sounds good. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining this session and uh, hope you at least understood how to build uh, a simple real world system. That was our objective to walk you through step by step, even people with basic Python knowledge. I'll share this whole, all the slides, all the code snippets, everything. Uh, and I'll put it in the description section of this video in just a few minutes after the session. Thank you from all the team at Applied AI course. Thank you for joining these sessions. Bye-bye.